All right, we are live in Eugene, Oregon on the last day of 2013 here at SEI. And I'm joined by Dr. Ken Pendleton and Jeff Sater. Welcome, gentlemen. Hi, Josh. Hi, Jeff. Hey. Happy almost new year to the two of you. Thank you, Josh. So I figured it would be a good way to end the year by us taking on a conversation we've been having internally for a while now, which is what are all the costs associated with some of the problems that we spend our time dealing with? And of course, any examples we use today won't be ones that we've worked with directly. These are ones that are public knowledge and, and all of that. But in broad terms, when we talk about costs, we're talking about two major currencies, one being dollars, tangible and intangible, the other being wins. Right? Ultimately, the goal in sport is to win, and wins matter, and we can talk about the effects that problems on and off the field have on wins. And Jeff, I was hoping you could kick us off today. Uh, you've been doing a fair amount of research trying to test a number of cases and figure out a workable tool for developing a reliable measure for costs. Can you give us a little bit of insight, obviously not going into all the details, but some of the major parameters that you've been wrestling with that we've been talking about as a group here? Sure, and uh, let me just say when you and I first started this conversation, uh, I don't know, at least two or three months ago, um, I thought I thought that this would be a rather simple tool to work with. As it turns out, there's there's actually so much going on in here. Um, but at least I have narrowed it down some to where I think there are some specific impacts that are relevant for a lot of different sports issues um, uh, that that you can look at and and that can give you a good idea of um, the types of costs you're dealing with. Um, so I'm going to go over a few of those right now. Um, a typical cost uh, for one is staff um, in this model. So this could be extra staff time. This could be money spent because of uh, uh, resignations, cost of rehiring, cost of buying out contracts. And you're also looking at not only administrative staff, but uh, coaching staff. Um, the intangibles here are obviously, um, you know, human resources, uh, especially if you have an experienced coach. Uh, they're bringing all this wealth of knowledge and everything into the business um, and into the team. And if that's lost due to conflict um, or if there's resulting employee morale issues, how do you calculate it, that in as well? Because some of these are going to be easily calculated to, to money. Some of them, them are going to lend themselves more to calculating towards wins or some other type of estimated cost in there. Um, next, you know, you obviously have athletes. Um, if you have uh, a lot of dollars in, you know, a pro and a pro player, and then all of a sudden you have a pro player who can't play because of suspension, suspension or injury, that's uh, money that's being wasted. Um, again, buying out of contracts, uh, loss of market value of an athlete. So then, even uh, less, less trading value in the future because of uh, certain conflict. Um, intangibles, you know, athlete morale, athlete performance um, on and off the field or court. Um, and when athletes' attentions are diverted to other matters, um, you know, what is it going to take away from wins? Are, are they going to be um, so distracted with other things going on that, that it's actually going to take away from their ability to focus on the game, which is what um, everybody wants them to be focused on. Um, the, the next thing I look at is uh, legal implications, uh, tangible stuff, legal fees, um, awarded damages, uh, resources devoted to legal matters. The intangible, of course, um, you know, all that time devoted to it, the stress, the um, amount of um, um, uh, slow suffering that goes on in the legal process for, for everybody involved. Um, and it, it also, a lot of these issues interrelate to each other because illegal issues can also be tied to public relations, which is perfect lead-in because public relations is the next thing that, going to briefly touch on here, the cost of all PR activities uh, designed to mitigate public fallout uh, from a conflict, um, and not to mention irreparable damage done to uh, team image and a variety of other costs. Um, that waning fan support could also reduce home team advantage. Uh, you, you know, <laughs> it, we've, we've, all, we've all seen that happen when um, it's something, something that doesn't go right for a team, and the next thing you know, you you have um, some some rather questionable fan support there. So building those by the public relations again 
is going to be something that's that's a large cost to to um, any sports organization um, if they if they incur a, you know some pretty questionable behavior or any type of conflict that really um, puts them out there in the spotlight. Uh, next, also related to that, um, donor and sponsor relations. Um, you know, a, a conflict could cause loss of major donor or sponsor um, dollars, uh, reduction in donations. Um, also, it could result in reduction of sponsorship uh, value. So, um, you know, if there's a lower value, then then your team could, in the long run, uh, not be getting as much value out of their out of their sports uh, sponsorship packages as, as they um, once had. Uh, so it also makes it harder to attract new sponsors, new donors. Um, less money in the organization means you're stifling the ab ability to bring in top talent, coaches, infrastructure. Um, these all help bring about wins, so that's all interrelated as well. Um, Next, and I, I'm going to try to be a little quicker here. I, there's so much in here that it's tough to, um, um, you know, really narrow it down and say this is just it, in a nutshell the whole model. But um, next, we got to look at penalties. And, and Jeff, I would imagine that depending on the situation, we'll we'll flesh this out a little bit with some examples. But some of these are going to be much more at play than others in particular situations. Right? For sure. Yeah, some of them are going to be um, obviously you're just going to zone in on a couple areas. Um, Maybe there's going to be a couple that take second, third seat that you know are cost um, that maybe aren't as easy to calculate. But I would say we're probably going to gravitate to the ones that are the easiest to readily calculate and come up with a value um, um, right there, which should be for about anyone um, involved in the, in the conflict. You know, 10 minutes sitting there and thinking about the issues, you probably got a rough value. Um, but uh, one of the next things I wanted to talk about was just penalties. Um, you know, penalties come in a, <laughs> many different ways. Uh, you could be restricted. I mean, look at USC bowl eligibility. Um, not being eligible for a bowl game, what does that cost? Well, yeah, you, you can't win at a bowl game, but you can't get there. You can't get the television exposure. Um, you can't get the dollars from that. Um, so that also affects the money come in, and um, loss of face due to misconduct, um, and then you also open the door to being highly scrutinized in the future um, for anything you do. I mean, you know, if a, if a program really has some penalties that come down on it, uh, what are you looking at? What are you looking at for the future? Every everything seems to be, and I think we've seen that in a few different scenarios. If you guys want to bring up any of those, uh, there. Where you have a team that maybe they have one uh, one large penalty that comes down on them the next, and you know everybody's talking about them, and, and every small thing they do becomes another PR nightmare. Um, versus, it wouldn't be that big of a deal had they not had the penalty in the first place. Um, other things that are very easy to calculate: merchandise sales. Uh, we have also ticket sales and concessions. These are things that are easily um, you know, you're, you're easily able to take a monetary value from. Um, and then also directly related is, oh, go ahead. Let, let me pause you there just so that we don't get lost in the details, but I think you've touched on some really important ones to, to kick us off. And why don't we try and bring it to life, uh, the three of us, and in looking through uh, an example or two, ideally one from a revenue-producing sport, one from a non-revenue-producing sport, where still there's impacts on wins and dollars in both of these scenarios. And again, these are situations where we don't have inside knowledge. This is just what we know from the outside looking in. These are not our clients or, or folks that we've worked directly with. Uh, Ken, would you, would you be willing to kick us off with an example and let's the three yeah. of us try and flesh it out? Right, and let's, let's um, not focus on the, on, the, on the ones with penalties for the moment, even though the costs of an incident like, you know, it happened with USC and Reggie Bush's very profound, right? Not to have, you know, to have monitored, you know, what, what your athletes were doing off the field led, you know, to a lot of the costs that Jeff has outlined. But I want to take something that actually falls, you know, that falls, you know, sort of below the NCAA radar. This year, the University of Florida suspended eight players during the season. I believe, and now that wasn't the only reason that Florida had its worst season since 1979. They lost their, their most important offensive player, their quarterback, Jeff Driscoll. 
they lost their best defensive player and a, a, a sure-fire high pick in the NFL draft in Dominique Easley. But the fact is, those, that the, the, they went from a team that was 11-2 11, 11 and two last year to a team that was 4-9 and nine this season. And the, they, they, the, the, these suspensions were only part of the problem, but at the very time when they needed all hands to the deck, as you, if you will, all available bodies, they were short bodies because of this. And so that had this really direct effect you know, they, of, of contributing to these nine losses to Florida Field, Ben Griffith State Field being empty for games, to not going to a bowl game for the first time since 1980, or you know, again, since that 79 season, or actually since they were on probation in 1990. Um, and it also, you know, it's probably hurt their merchandising, it's hurt their recruiting. There's a possibility the number of high-profile commitments that, it, you know, are, are actually going to choose other programs, and, um, and, we'll, and that may very well happen today with one of the most highly recruited players in the country who's going to announce in a couple hours. They've also had their, their coaching staff. They've let their offensive coordinator go. They've uh, they had to do it. They had to spend a couple of weeks on the search. So they, they you know which has hurt their again which has hurt their recruiting. So there are all the you know these really tangible harms that all these suspensions led to. But also you have to say what does it do for the morale of the program? Is that part of the reason that seven players have transferred? You know since the season ended. And so what about the enjoyment of the players had during that experience? How might it have affected their academic work with all this? It's hard enough to function during football season. Imagine trying to be part of such a, you know, you know, you know of a ship that's not only sinking, but where all the crew is fighting with, you know, are, are engaged in, and, and, you know, there's a lot of acrimony that could come up from these kind of issues. And so these were some of the challenges that, you know, Coach uh, Muschamp, has had to face because of these suspensions, and I and and so I think, in this in a case of a revenue generating sport, you know we really get to see a lot of the costs of that borne out. But it, it'd be interesting to you know sort of compare that to say an, an, a non revenue sport. And so Josh, I think you, you're very well versed on what happened with Oregon State's women's basketball program a couple years ago. So I, I you know I think it might be useful to outline that, and we can sort of look at you know what you know what what similarities and what differences there are between the two. Yeah, so a nice example, or not so nice example in a lot of ways, was uh, Oregon State had a coach, LaVonda Wagner, who was highly touted uh, as being extremely skilled and knowledgeable of the sport and was given a lot of leeway in, uh, to coach her team and, and do what she wanted regardless of what was going on on or off the court. Um, and so not a lot of insight was going on on the team during those years, and this happened couple of years ago where it finally came to light. What, some of the allegations that led to her firing were that she had student athletes on diet pills, that she had them um, well exceeding the hours that were permissible for practice time, that she was verbally um, quite abusive to her athletes, often calling them fat and lazy, uh, swearing at them, um, somewhat physically abusive to them as well. And it really didn't come out until the point where this had gone down a road where each year their performance on the court got worse and worse, no matter who was being recruited. And and when it finally came to a head was when some of the student athletes essentially walked off of practice and refused the return to the point where she did not have enough athletes to field a team. And that's when administration got involved. And so here, not only do we see it uh, playing out at, at the moment of when the conflict really comes ahead, but you see all those lost years of development for the program and then the reputational issues of who who would send their daughter to this program anytime in the immediate future after that, right? Of course, you know, some people, if it's your only scholarship opportunity, maybe it's something you consider. Maybe a new coach does restore some of that, but but that, that takes a lot of time. And, and when you think about those costs, and I'd love to hear Jeff work with us to flesh out some of those, you know, tangibles and intangibles. Certainly... Both of these examples, uh, on the court and on the field, we saw huge performance declines from what their previous, you know, baseline was and what their talent level predicted they should be. And then the question becomes, what are all these other intangibles, brand and everything else, and, and dollars, and can we get even a broad stroke of how m much this figure is we're talking about in either of these examples? Because if, if you get an order of magnitude of the money involved, and the impact, then I think it gives you a better sense of, of what you might be willing to invest to prevent some of these problems. So Jeff or Ken, do either of you want to try and flesh these examples out a little bit more from a 
a dollars and wins standpoint. It's it's interesting. I'm looking at a couple different studies right right now that I've pulled up before, and um, um, from looking at Ken's example, um, we have uh, television ex appearances are positively related to contributions. So. If you go have a team that goes from eleven and two to what four and nine, Ken, mm -hmm. um, then I, I I gotta expect that their television um, appearances are are not there for that four and nine season. Uh, meaning number one, well they're not getting television revenue. But uh, secondly, related to that is that um, it's been found from this study that uh, donor contributions uh, will be uh, less as well. Right, um, it's a little more subtle, and I, I, I want to um, than that because, in this case, because they, well, they were that four and eight record because they didn't they didn't qualify for the postseason. Um, they, they're Florida's on TV every week in some form, and furthermore, they share the SEC's television money, right? So they have some, you know, they have a kind of safety net built in. But what changes is where they appear. For example, by the end of the year, their games were only available on ESPN3 unless you, you know, unless you lived in Florida or in the Southeast, whereas, yeah. as opposed to being on ESPN or ESPN2 or, or what have you. Or, and, or on, or, and they only appeared on CBS a couple times at the beginning of the season and, and, and not, not at all after the Georgia game in early November, where if they have a successful season, they're going to get that kind of profile. And that has myriad economic impacts on the, you know, in 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 terms of merchandise sales, in terms of donors, in terms of bowl revenue, in terms of all sorts of things. And then and then the other thing is in the long run, it, they have to now the challenge that Coach Muschamp has is he's now a lame duck coach because he, or not, he he's on the verge of being a lame duck coach because if he does not have a good season next season, he's probably out. And that could very. He's now got to worry about how do you recruit? When a recruit, you can't guarantee a recruit you're going to be there more than one year, right? So all of a sudden, Florida may find itself on a treadmill where they have they have a tough time actually getting the quality of athletes they that they need to compete at the level that they, their fans are addicted to them being at, right? And and so there's this you know there's this huge potential sort of domino effect that could come out of this. And you, you may say, no, nah, it's Florida. They're one of the five biggest programs in the country. They'll turn it around. Well, George, I mean, uh, Tennessee, for example, has gone through coach after coach since Phil Former left. And so and it's very hard once you replace coaches sometimes to find one who can bring the stability and the credibility back to a program. And so they, you know, there are these. It's they, they are in the SEC. They're in the wealthiest conference in America, and their and their revenue stream from TV isn't directly going to be impacted very much. But there, for sure, is a huge impact from having your TV exposure downscaled. So Jeff, when you when you look at some of these, uh, the Florida example or or the OSU example, just give us broad stroke order of magnitude. Are we talking about? Tens of thousands of dollars? Are we talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars? Are we talking about millions? What what are the kind of costs as you play it out with some of these levels when you're talking about staff and athletes and legal and public relations, recruiting, merchandise, all, all these different areas? I mean, and we don't need an exact dollar figure. Obviously, that takes some time to work through a worksheet on this, but just the, the broad stroke, how major are these things? Uh, you know, if you're an athletic director or someone watching this show, what what do you expect the impact to be? I I mean the the Ken's first example of uh, Florida there I I I look at that and I think wow that could go anywhere from hundreds of thousands of dollars to uh, towards up in the millions I mean because it's a long term effect who knows how long the program is going to be down for um, I mean they could be in a hole for quite a while because of this they could dig out of it uh, sooner than people expect but either way um, it's it's going to be a cost for a while here. Um, uh, the the other the other example of uh, OSU you gave there, um, well, I, I mean again you have a rebuilding process. Now it's it's not like uh, that's not a revenue sport, really. So you're not looking at um, I mean reduction in ticket sales and stuff like that is a drop in the bucket, but um, all these other things that you're looking at are uh, are there potential legal costs coming. As a, as a result, right. um, recruiting is stifled. Um, uh, gosh, I, I mean the the PR impact um, that it's that it's had. I mean they're 
going to whoever um, you know comes in. They need to they need to somehow change their image uh, to get more recruits to come in um, to get people to actually uh, uh, forget about it. And um, that can happen, but not without not without cost. So and and Ken might have some more to say about mm -hmm. that specifically. Well, yeah, I was going to say, in the case of a of a high level, you know, I'm going to, you know, pro, of a revenue generating program, the costs could very easily go into the millions. For you know, just the most obvious example, if all of a sudden your coach has to be replaced, you you know, the, and you have to buy out his contract, that in and of itself could be millions. You have to now pay someone at at a you know maybe at a at a at a, at a, at a higher level to induce someone to come into your program. And then you have to pay their their assistance, which is I mean, the coaches think about their do they have the budget for their assistance, and that may go you know you may have to all of a sudden do buyouts and and have to pay for new you know and pay the new assistance at the same time. In the case of something like Oregon State, I think one of the hidden the real hidden costs here is all of a sudden staff who may be primarily dedicated to dealing with the revenue sports like the athletic director, all of a sudden he now has to or she has to spend time on a sport they may want to largely let let run of its own devices and I, I'll tell you an anecdote and I can't give you the specifics but a friend of mine was an assistant soccer is it was an assistant soccer coach and they had some NCAA violations and the assistant athletic director pulled him in the coach aside and said the two co it pulled, and had this really revealing comment he said don't you understand we're less concerned about whether you win than whether you embarrass us. And what he was, and so you know, the great advantage of being in the non-revenue sports in a lot of instances, there's a lot less pressure for that bottom line of winning or generating revenue. But there's a tremendous cost to the university when you have a scandal that occurs, and that's what that that you know that assistant athletic director was saying to the you know the head coach of of that soccer team. He was basically saying, look. You're going to be out, you know. We'll give you a lot of latitude and a lot of time for results, but we're not. We have very little latitude for you causing us negative publicity because that's just not something we want to have to bear as an athletic department. <laughs> and, and so, you know, I think that's a great illustration of how there's a crossover between those two different types of cases. And, and absolutely, when you if you spend any time with any of these athletic departments. You, you may, from the outside looking in, be impressed with the budgets, but if you spend time with them, you realize how thin they're already stretched when things are going great. Um, staff tend to work tremendous amounts of hours for actually relatively low pay compared to their counterparts. Now, it gets overshadowed by high-profile coaches, but put that aside for a moment. Uh, and, and so when they're working on crises or conflict or issues or problems or whatever you want to call them, they're spending time they don't have on these issues with whatever teams that are involved with it and it's extremely laborious so beyond the direct tangible costs those intangible costs seem incredibly important and, and if you're spending time on that what aren't you spending time on right um, yes yeah, so I feel like we, we could really you know there's there's such a broad range of, of costs here and I think those intangible ones you know do you want to work and you know what is it doing to your day-to-day -day, the quality of your day-to-day -day life you know the kind of kind of moment where you throw up your hands and go who needs this you know why do you know? I thought I was getting in. Here's this, you know, this world, the sports world that I joined because I love sports, and I'm spending all my time having to put out fires in areas about you know that were, weren't really primary to what I you know was interested in when I took this job, and so I sort of feel like it, it, I'm going to shift this a little bit now and say, so how, what how, what you know how do we think about this in terms of our our idea? And it's you know we, we resolve conflicts when need be, but better still, we want to try to prevent them. Right, and I think that's you know, you know that's a theme I, I I think is really worth trying to sort of you know emphasize and try to really point out to programs that there'd be a tremendous value in trying to think about what steps could you take to make sure to not have to suspend eight players or not have to have a you know an intervention you know after after players make serious allegations about a coach's misconduct. It, it's funny. Uh, a lot of times, uh, athletic departments find it difficult to find budget for some of the things that seem trivial at the outset. You know, some of the alignment activities you can do around teams at the beginning, some of the postseason assessments you can do, it, it seems like extra cost. The, the, the irony of it is that when a problem happens, you have to find the budget to deal with investigations and legal teams and everything else that happens, and that cost is many, many, many orders of magnitude larger 
than the cost of the, the reasonable activities you can do to create structures and processes in place to really make sure that your department, your team is functioning in a very healthy way. And, and, and furthermore, uh, these things have real impact on helping you win at a higher rate and a higher level. And so, so really the thing I would encourage uh, folks to do is make sure that they are investing up front because the cost of these type of activities of, of bringing experts in or, or you know, making sure your staff has a skill set to do this, create the proper alignment, create the checks and balances along the way, create insight with postseason assessments to be able to prevent these problems is so inexpensive compared to the cost of one issue. So you can prevent dozens of issues with doing this, or you wait till that one issue happens and you spend 10, 20 times more um, just resolving that issue, and it's quite unsatisfying to spend your time doing that. Yeah, I, I, I find myself thinking of that old adage and say, you can pay us now or you can pay us more later. <laughs> that that the, you know, the, there's a relatively small cost that comes with actually preventing things, and there's a great cost that, it's a much greater cost if you wait until you have to actually put out that fire afterwards. Right, you could take any one area that Jeff highlighted for us today. Uh, even just looking at athletes, the cost of recruiting an athlete to your school, and if you can't deal with some of the issues that pop up and your transfer rate is high, think of how much is lost in terms of the potential of, of using that talent for your program, of having that individual then go on to another school, of all the time you spent recruiting that individual, of the scholarship money perhaps that you spent, whatever else it is, where if you could have prevented a problem, you know, through better communication channels, better issue and risk management, um, you know, better better crisis management when things first happen, better awareness, openness, transparency, all the things that we talk about. It, it's it's phenomenal how much cost can be prevented. And I know that at times there's a lot of revenue in some sports. At times there's a lot of budget. Donors are very generous throughout uh, collegiate. The professional teams at times have a lot of money. But, but still, that doesn't mean that you should just let it go away with problems you should, and not be diligent about it. Uh, any final thoughts from uh, either of you before we wrap things up here on the final day of 2013? Um, I would just have to say a little little plug for the ombuds model just because uh, I, I get to work with that a little bit with youth sports. And um, um, I would say uh, looking at that model, what it costs, and the fact that an organization is um, um, making a step towards towards continual policy improvement by having an uh, ombudsman around, um, whether it's part-time or whatever, if you have some type of conflict ally that you're working with, um, it seems to me that whenever you run across a situation that is a uh, toe stumper, you, you don't just accidentally make the wrong, wrong decision. You have somebody to... Uh, you know, an ear to fall back on and, and to really assess things first before you um, make a small problem a bigger one. Um, and, and that's what I see so much of is, is uh, um, small things that, uh, you know, I, honestly there are problems that are solved in five minutes that could end up being significant. Um, and, and so, yeah, I, I, I look at it and I think, man, sometimes I think, man, I really am worth it, worth it here, you know? So, uh um, I'm, I'm a fan of the model, so there we go. I'll just plug that one for you. And, um, and, and the um, interesting thing, Jeff, is that ombudsman is one of the more expensive tools we have at our disposal, and still the studies show somewhere between a three to 500% return on investment conservatively for organizations that have an ombuds in place and, and what they save on that. So you know, what we're talking about here is not about doing the right thing, but we're talking about good business, leading to good outcomes, higher wins, higher revenue streams, not about uh, something more soft or esoteric. So absolutely, in the ombuds model, I like that example so much because it really is one of the more expensive models we have, and yet it still yields a tremendous return on your investment for doing so. Yeah, and, and I think maybe we, the way to conclude here is to say that in the, in the value isn't just a, of an ombuds model, isn't just preventing the conflict that, that goes public in a dramatic way like at Oregon State. It could have all sorts of more subtle effects on, say, a team just you know winning two or you know two or three more games a year because a conflict that could have risen to a higher level 
was actually addressed and the two parties were able to find some meaningful common ground or have their dispute mediated in a way that was mutually satisfactory and that led better that led to better playing performance and better you know and better coach player you know or better coach player relationship or better teammate relationships right and so the you know the the ombud in the ombuds model is is just one of many different types of tools that could be used to try to take on these problems you know in in, in try to prevent them from arising or minimize their impact when they start to arise. Well, well gentlemen, that's a great way to end it. Uh, all these conversations, I look forward to them all the time, and it's even more fun when we get to share it with our public audience. Uh, let me conclude with a round of applause for the two of you. And Happy New Year. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>